Mr. McDonald. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. Very good. Okay, let's get started. On the record, good morning. This is the March 9, 2023 meeting of the Southern Region Board of Review. This hearing is being held via WebEx video conference at the Perry B. Derrier Junior State Office Building, 250 Veterans Memorial Highway, rooms two and three, Hop Hog, New York, 11788, and the New York State Department of State, One Commerce Plaza, 99 Washington Avenue, conference room 505, Albany, New York, 12210. The time is now 934 and this hearing is officially open. <clears throat> the members of the board today are Eric Schaub, Andrew Hames, Andy Ellis up in Albany, and myself, Robert Peterson Chairman. From the Department of State is Mr. Courtney Nation. We will now hear the scheduled petitions. When you speak, please address the board and give your name, title, and legal address so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. In making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on matters referring to your exhibits to enable the court reporter to enter these into the record. The first hearing is in the matter of petition number 2022-0483. The petitioner is Christopher, Christopher McDonald and the aggrieved party is the Brentwood Union Free School District. This petition pertains to additions and alterations to an existing school building of an e-education occupancy, two stories in height, type 2B non-combustible construction. The existing building is approximately 119,200 square feet in gross total, total gross floor area and will be approximately 124,900 square feet in gross area with the proposed addition. The building is located at 33 Leahy Avenue, Town of Islip, Suffolk County, State of New York. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1227, the 2020 existing building code of New York State, Section 1102.2 which states an addition shall not increase the area of an existing building beyond that permitted under the applicable provisions of chapter five of the building code of New York state for new buildings, unless fire separation as required by the building code of New York state is provided. The petitioner requests relief from the applicable provisions of chapter five brought about by an addition, specifically 19 NYCRR part 1221, the 2020 building code of New York state section 506.2.3, which requires that the allowable area of a single occupancy building with more than one story above grade plane shall be determined in accordance with equation 5-2. The petitioner requests that a building exceeding the allowable, allowable area limitations of equation 5.2 be permitted <clears throat> and 19 NYCRR part 1227, the 2020 existing building code of New York State section 1102.3, which states existing fire areas increased by the addition shall comply with chapter nine of the building code of New York State. Petitioner requests relief from the applicable provisions of Chapter 9 brought about by an addition, specifically 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 903.2.3, which states in relevant part that an automatic sprinkler system shall be provided for Group E occupancies as follows. Number one, throughout all Group E fire areas greater than 12,000 square feet in area. Number two, the group E fire area is located on a floor area, a floor other than a level of exit discharge serving such occupancies. The petitioner requests that a two story addition be allowed without a sprinkler installation. Okay, Mr. McDonald, you're up. Larry, this is Chris McDonald. I'm the project manager at Tech to Tech. Um, and we were looking for this. Turn on what? A variance on this code. Once the camera turns on. Okay, would you be able to turn your camera on, please? Sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Here we go. Okay, do we have a presentation today or you want us to start asking questions? Uh, I would, yeah, I don't really have a presentation. I guess if uh, there was just questions that was um, that needed answers uh, uh, based on the email that we got. Can you go through the summary of the request and talk about your building and just the basics, get the basic points so we can get an understanding? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the uh, existing building um, was built in uh, sorry, excuse me, just get my notes here together. Um, uh, 
We have a 1960, the original building was 1960 at 57, 320. Then we have a 1978 two-story building of 38,100. Yep. 2000, 2002 two-story building of 16,550. And a 2010 one-story addition, 1,530. And then you're seeking relief for a new addition of 5,720 two-story addition to expand a non-conforming school. Yes, we're currently, um, there's four classrooms in a portable building um, that have reached the end of their life. Uh, we're looking to add those four classrooms onto the, ex onto the existing building. Um, we're adding it onto the end of the 2010 edition. Um, we're looking to do a, a, a two-story addition because the property is, is um, on the smaller side. There's not a lot of land at this point um, to build on, and there's a road that goes around the, the building that would, um, would be, be interrupted by a, uh, a, a one-story four-classroom addition. So, uh, I mean, is this complex legally pre-existing non-conforming, or was there some additions that were done that were approved properly? So the, the original um, addition that was done in 1978 was the code was different then, so it was conforming at the time. Um, but at the at the that the current under the current code is non-conforming. So you think from 78 to 2002, that 2002 addition expanded the fire area, and that was something that exacerbated the nonconformity? So 1678 um, conceivably could have been in compliance at the time? The 2002 addition was done, uh, a firewall was provided between the two buildings, so um, that was the 2002 was, was conforming. And now we're adding on to that, uh, that portion of the building which is conforming. It, it's a little unclear from the drawings, uh, the uh, key versus the symbol on the uh, building, the, the wall between the new addition and the existing. Is that a firewall? It's a fire partition, two hour fire partition. So it's a fire barrier wall. It's not, you don't have structural independent collapse on, on the addition to the existing building, or is it just uh, a we, we actually, it would be, yes, it would have a, a, it would be built as a firewall. So correct me if I'm wrong, Courtney, that would be classified as a firewall, correct? Uh, yes, but firewalls mean um, a fire protective, an opening protective. Okay. N none was shown on the, um, the drawing. Okay. Is there an opening protective in that opening? So if we look at, I like, got uh, the sheet drawing, I'll reference HG050. HG050, yes. Yeah, so there's a, a, a linear delineate, excuse me, delineation of a two hour fire barrier line from old to new. Correct. Um, though you're saying that's a fire wall because you'd have essentially a separate building you're adding on with independent structural collapse. Correct. That opening in the corridor, we need to have an opening protective. We and could provide doors, we could provide doors, fire doors there. That and not exceed done. the 25% aggregate of the wall with the openings, which I think in your letter states that you don't exceed. Correct. So that, that would be true on both the first and second floors. Correct. Okay. The sprinklers. What's that? Sprinklers. Sprinklers. What are they doing to compensate for the lack of sprinklers? Yeah, so one of the variances are a request to not comply with uh, 900 of the building code, which is the sprinkler systems. Um, where's the hardship there to put a sprinkler system in the addition? We would, it would require a, um, a water line to be run through the boiler room, which is on the opposite end of the building. Um, 
to do that, we would have to run a four inch uh, water line, um, approximate costs in the range of 225,000 to 260,000 just for that um, installation. You would need a four inch line for this small addition? That's what we were, yes, that's what we were in the understanding, yes. That sounds excessive. Could you run a separate line in from the street? We'll be running from where the uh, water comes into the building, which is in the boiler room, which is about 600 uh, feet from the addition. But there's, there's bathrooms being added. So where is that water coming from? That's coming from the existing building, but the requirement for the sprinkler would be um, excess of that uh, supply. Is the, the 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 existing building doesn't have sprinklers right now? That is correct. It's got a fire alarm system. It's got a full fire alarm system throughout the building. So for life safety, typically we like to see compartmentalization or compartmentalize, you know, uh, I guess each portion. I, I don't really want to dig into the existing building, but if we're looking at the addition between old and new, um, would it be so difficult to fire rate the floors, a horizontal separation as well? That could be done, yes. What is it presently presented as? Is it, is, is it, it's a type 2B, right? It's 2B, so I don't think it's required to be. Okay, so you would be amenable to a two hour there? We can do that, yes. Okay. So a firewall, independent structural collapse, two hour horizontal separation, opening protectors. Um, in, in the addition, there's a, a two, two corridors up for them. One uh, from the uh, existing going straight through and out, and then the other one that's parallel to the stairs, uh, what are the walls, the rating of the walls of that corridor, uh, other than the separation between the old and this? Um, my understanding, I think that those walls are all one hour. Fire partition. Yeah, it says indoor wall, all corridor walls, one hour fire partition. So ground floor, you know, it's, you're, you're out the building pretty quickly. You know, there's two classrooms. We have two options for exits out of the addition part. The second floor, um, you got to go back into the existing building to get help, which I kind of have trouble with, but. Um, well, you're going it, back into the building and then back into the new addition. You're going back into right? the building, you enter and exit stairs, and, and then, then back into the building. No, they have continuity on the first floor for the exit and closure. Is that correct, Chris? Yes, that is correct. The, the stair tower is rated, and then you're exiting into a rated um, exit passage just for the stairs. I mean, I. I'm what's just what's the rate? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just speaking for myself, but it, it would be nice if you can just exit out the addition without going back into the building. That would require a stair installed. Yeah, I don't think it's really well I don't know. Do you have room to do that? Is that something that is difficult to achieve? That would be difficult to achieve, correct. So if I look at the site plan, you got the loop road, which is the emergency vehicle access lane. Correct. And what's that area where that dimension is, the 488? Is that just like a walkway? I think that's the, the, the from the existing building line to the, to the driveway. You know, uh, my question was, what's in that area? What is that, that area right now? Yeah, would that prohibit an exterior stair or some kind of stair tower installed over there? Oh, on that end of the building? Uh, I'm just making a suggestion to, to be able to exit out of the second floor without going back into the existing building. That is, that is a, like a, a, a area of entry to the um, existing building. So there's like an entry plaza into that? Correct, into that, into yeah. that courtyard. The niche? Okay. Yeah. 
This is there a hydro nearby over there? Where the hydrants are. The hydrants. Yeah, it's three two fifty. This is this is Bill Wispower also from Tetra Tech. I'm the licensed architect that's stamping these drawings. All right. Just one. How are you? Uh, one one inform piece of information that possibly would help you on this, and I know. Um, in looking at this because this is a new code change with the sprinkler requirements all right um you should know that this this building actually goes through eight emergency fire drills per year all right and the exiting time currently right now for that building is less than 2.4 minutes that they evacuate roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of thousand kids so the evacuation procedures that they do in the school and the training, they get the kids out of that building very quickly, just so you understand. Appreciate that. Good point. What's the rating on the existing stairwell that they're now entering? One hour. Yeah. That's a one hour? Yes. OK. Also, there's one other point maybe I should make. Again, I've been doing schools for about 40 years, and anytime we've done anything with the state education department where we've tried to propose increasing areas so we would, and we would have to add, add sprinklers, they've always tried to get us to reduce the areas and not do sprinklers. Bureau of Facilities Planning does not like the idea of putting sprinklers in schools, especially in classroom areas. They would rather have you cut down and reduce the area for smoke issues and to get the kids out versus having large areas where there might be more smoke just because you can add sprinklers. Understood. We had a few schools in the past that had that same situation. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any other questions? We were talking about compartmentalizing the existing building. Um, do you have fire barriers throughout the existing complex, separating the fire areas as defined in the building additions? I, I don't really see an exhibit that shows that you have proper separation. There is. There was a question about that between the um, 1978 addition and the 1960 original building. Um, there is a door. We, we missed it on our plans. Um, it's on the far side between the near the gym over to the um, classroom wing. Um, so there is a, there is a the 19, 1978 building is separated from the uh, rest of the building. Would it be too much trouble to share the screen and point that out? Is that possible? Um, I would have to bring up a drawing. So let me. I just want to make sure I understood that. Um, the gymnasium, there's a corridor that runs down the side of the gymnasium. Yes. And then and it that, terminates at a double door, I guess. Oh, no, actually four doors. Four doors to the exterior? Is that what you're looking at? No, there's two doors to the exterior. Okay, I'm looking at a different spot. Then let me know. Am I on the first or second floor? I'm on the, I'm on the ground floor. There's like a, like a railroad track looking hatch. I'm just trying to bring up the drawing of you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you could see it. Yeah. So I don't know where the doors are missing. Uh, just sorry, I'm just give me just give me a second to bring up the drawing. 1978 edition.
1978 edition is the largest piece of the campus, right? Um, no, the original is, I think, the largest. Um, so where's the break between? Yeah. Since the edition is 1978. Um, okay. I think. Um, that's the 2002. That's the 2002. Yeah, just a quick kind of go through on the on where the breaks are between the um, series of additions that were made. The original building, new addition. The 2010 is easy. It's small in the bottom corner there. But yes, I brought up a drawing. I don't know if you can see it. I'm not great, but Chris, can you click off that rearrange videos? Uh, Give it a shot, Chris. I think we got it. Click off. I don't know what what you're talking about, Bill. I don't know. On my screen, it's showing something that says rearrange your video. Yes. Maybe it's... Bill, you can just hit the X on that. Oh, okay. Got it. Sorry. Um, trying to zoom, but it's not letting me. Unfortunately, I can't zoom. This. Uh, can you see my my hand moving? Yeah, we see it. So this this portion of the building is the 1960 original building. Got it. This piece in here, which is a, a two-story gym, was it was added in 1978. So we were missing we were missing a set of doors right here that separated the 1960 from the 78. Okay. Is that by vestibule 23A? A corridor 101 over there? Uh, 23. Yes, corridor, corridor 101, correct. Well, yeah, corridor 101 where it, it's at the vestibule 23A. Yep. yep. That this was this was missing a door that was um, we 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 found out that that was missing from the plan. So that separates the 78 edition from the 1960 original building. Is there is there like a two-hour fire barrier breaking up of those two additions? The original the way, building? The way the original drawings look, it looks like it was built that way, yes. Because it's sort of like that vestibule link where it connects to the 78 building. Right? It looks, it looks like that door and that, that area was built okay. as a fire separation, correct. Okay. And then between the 78 and the 2002, do we have a fire break there? That is a two hour, a true two hour firewall. Okay. So that breaks that piece off from the, from the set, from the 78 and the, also the 60 original. That's just for the first floor. How about the second? Second floor yeah. was also uh, separated by a firewall. It goes completely up. Oh, so you heard that just for the record, there was a question on if it's on both floors or just the ground floor. So if you go to the second floor, the 78 edition is two stories. The original campus building is one story. And you have a firewall separation between the 78 and the 2002 edition on okay. the second floor. Okay. Yep, on the second floor, correct. Okay. It goes all the way up to the roof. And now we're going to create another firewall separation between this approximately 6,000 square foot addition between 2002 edition and 2023. Right. So I think there was a question before we, we came on the record about distance travel to exits and stuff. Can you just summarize that on each floor? Correct. Um, I have that on this drawing. I, I, it's not allowing me to zoom, but the, the largest on the first floor, the largest travel distance is 256 feet from, from door to door. And that's in this zone right here. And what's the code requirement for a non-sprinkler building? Um, I think it's two, 200 max from any space within the building. Yeah, the most remote point 
to right. exit discharge? Or? So that's from door to door. So any point within that, when you're stepping through the one hour fire barrier, you're, you have it, you can go either way. So it would be under 200 feet. Doesn't state ed require, um, this is Courtney, doesn't state ed require uh, a more stringent travel distance than is found in the code? Um, we are going by state ed, so I, I, I'm assuming that that's the number, the, the, the code, what's, is the code higher maybe? No, we, we don't work for state ed. So um, my understanding is that state ed has a more stringent travel distance requirement than is found in the code. Would anybody speak to that? Yes, that is my understanding. I'd have to get you the, this is Bill Wispower. That's my understanding. And I'd have to get you the specifics on it if you want. Well, we're looking at the building code. I know, but if they have, uh, it's a finding in their favor, if the travel distance is less, yeah. uh, it, it's less than it's required by the codes. The um, alarm system for the building, can you describe what is being done, the fire alarm system? Under the new, uh, for just the, the addition? Yeah, sorry. We'll be adding, um, uh, fire, fire um, annunciators in each of the classrooms and each of the uh, actually occupied spaces. Um, there'll be smoke detectors on in the corridors on either side of the um, the doors that, that in the, so it would be in the addition and on the um, in the existing um, on, on where the door separates. Um, there'll be annunciators in the toilet rooms. And in the corridors, there'll be enunciators and smoke detectors. And there'll be pull stations at the exit doors. There are also, this is Bill Wispower, there's also smoke detectors in uh, the ductwork. So just for my clarification, again, if we can go back to the travel distance. So once this addition is put on, is the travel distance increased? and still compliant from the first floor and the second floor. So it's it's a straight shot out the building on the ground floor with an additional, I'm trying to read, is it additional 68 feet? Oh no, that's. The, the exit to exit on the first floor is 68 feet. From this door to this door is 68 feet. So if we're in the 2002 edition and we were using that second exit out, you now have to go an additional how many feet? Um, it would go into the exit passageway out, so that the travel would be to that door, or to exit discharge. Yes. So I'm just curious if that addition, because it's not really demonstrated on the drawings. Is there an issue with the travel distance now that you added on? There should not be an issue with the travel distance. No, it's still within the within the required. Okay, and then on the second floor. You go into the existing stair to this exit passage way out. So essentially, the travel distance is affected in the existing 2002 building. And it's, is that a correct statement? Because it's the same? The 2002 building remains the same. We don't remains the same. That. Yeah, I was talking out loud. It remains the same. And then in the addition, you're compliant. Correct. Once you're in the exit, but you're going back into the existing building. To it's exit, exit. Just, yeah. yeah, and then you're entering into a, a rated stair tower. Yeah, and then into an exit passageway out. Correct, a rated okay. passageway. Correct. Yeah. Have these plans been reviewed by state ed? They have been, and they have been approved pending your variant, the the approval of this variance. What about by the uh, local fire marshal? We don't, uh, we don't have to um, submit to a local fire marshal. That's all through. It's all, all the only reviewer is SED. Okay, so I don't have any more questions. I think uh, 
you guys were amenable to some conditions, I guess we have to talk it out. Um, any other questions? No. No? Okay. Thank you, Andy. Um, we're going to go deliberate. We'll be back as uh, quick as possible with a decision. Do we stay in? Yes. Yeah, hang tight. We'll be right back. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Okay. On the record. Yeah. You guys ready? I'm ready. Okay. With respect to the petition of uh, 2022-0483 Brentwood Union Free School District, the petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1227, the 2020 Existing Building Code of New York State, Section 1102.2, 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 506.2.3, 19 NYCRR Part 1227, the 2020 Existing Building Code of New York State, Section 1102.3, and 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 903.2.3. The board makes the following findings. Number one, subject building is properly classified as a Group E education occupancy, two stories in height of type 2B construction. The building provides instruction for ninth grade high school freshman students. Number two, the school building is non conforming with respect to Section 506 of the 2020 Building Code of New York State and the sprinkler provisions of the 2020 Building Code of New York State. A 57,320 square feet, one-story building was originally built in 1960. A two-story 34,100 square foot addition was made in 1978. A two-story 16,550 square foot addition was constructed in 2002. And a one-story 1,530 square foot addition was built in 2010. Number three, existing building has approximately 89,890 square feet first floor area and a 19,610 square foot second floor area. In testimony, the existing building, in testimony, the petitioner stated the existing building is legally non-conforming, or we established that it's legally non-conforming. Number four, a 5,720 square foot two-story addition is proposed, I lost my, bear with me. A 5,020 square foot two-story addition is proposed to create four additional classrooms, a resource room, and toilet rooms, and is the subject of this determination. These additions will be of type 2B construction. Correct the number you said 5,720 5, square foot two-story addition. Thank you, Randy. Number five, this two-story addition would be required by provisions of section 1102.3 of the existing building code of New York State and section 903.2.3 of the Building Code of New York State to have a sprinkler inst installation within the entire fire area corresponding to the proposed addition. Number six, requirement for providing sprinklers at floor levels other than the level of exit discharge is new to the Uniform Code and became fully effective in May 2020 when the 2020 Building Code of New York State was introduced. Number seven, the petitioner has indicated that the installation of a sprinkler system would cost approximately 225,000 to 260,000 would impose a significant economic burden. Number eight, the code does allow existing construction to be separated from an addition by a firewall, thereby allowing the addition to be regulated separately. Number nine, the application has provided details five, six, and seven on sheet HA200 of the drawing submitted with this application that indicates substantial conformance to the provisions for a firewall at section 706 of the 2020 building code of new york state except that the required opening protect protectives have not been shown on the drawings with the addition of a true firewall with opening protectives variances for 19 nycrr 1227 the 2020 existing building code of new york state section 1102.2 and 19 nycrr 1221 of the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 506.2.3 will no longer be required. Number 10, the proposed addition will increase the exit travel distance for existing portions of the building in the immediate vicinity of the addition. However, the petitioner indicated it does comply with the state education requirements. 11, the school building is equipped with fire alarms throughout and will be included in a new addition as well. Number 12, the presence of fire alarms throughout the building and the emphasis placed on fire drills in the typical school environment suggests that evacuation times of considerably less than one hour 
are achievable and would likely preserve life safety. 13, the code official representing the state agency responsible for code enforcement supports the applicant's request for variance relief in this matter. So, with respect to 19 NYCRR Part 1227, the 2020 existing building code of New York State, Section 1102.3, and 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 903.2.3. Uh, are we missing something? No. The board finds strict compliance with the provisions to the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code would entail practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship and would create an excessive and unreasonable economic burden and would be unnecessary in light of alternatives which ensure the achievement of the code's intended objective or in light of alternatives which without a loss in the level of safety achieve the code's intended objective more efficiently, effectively, or economically. And the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the uniform code's provisions for health, safety, and security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance from the provisions of 19 NYCRR Part 1227, the 2020 existing building code of New York State, Section 1102.3, and 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 building code of New York State, Section 903.2.3, B and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. Condition number one, that the division between existing and proposed addition shall be a true two-hour firewall with opening protectives. There shall also be a two-hour horizontal fire separation between the first and second floor of the proposed addition. Number two, that the building shall be equipped with an approved fire alarm system throughout. Number three, that the main openings for passage between the proposed addition and the existing building shall have protectives as required by section 716 of the 2020 building code of New York State and shall be held open by fire alarm activated hold open devices. Number four, that in all other respects, the provisions of the uniform fire prevention and building code shall be complied with. I need a motion to approve with these conditions. Andrew, so Can I get a second? I have a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Andy and Albany? Aye. All right, motion is approved. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this application. Okay, gentlemen, so those were the conditions for approval. Do you have any questions? No, those are fine. Thank you very much for your uh, time and effort. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye now. We combine them. Oh, you have to you have to admit us, uh, Andy, because I can get. Oh, uh, okay. What's up?
Courtney, are you okay. there? Uh, yes, I am. Right, we're ready for the next case. Uh, the petition is here. Lieutenant Rivon there. Yeah, I have a Robert Barback. Robert Barback is by uh, via WebEx. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Barback. How are you? And here. I guess we got a mute. I'm just re I'm just replacing the 2020, 15 with 2020, right? Anything else? Fire code of New York State. Here, Mr. Barback. Oh, fire code of New York State. So no longer the international fire, code, but same section. Mr. Barba, could you test your speaker again just to make sure we can hear you the microphone? Well, it's a quick read, so we got about two minutes. No, but he's, he's talking, we're not hearing, so. How's the audio, Andy, for you? I'm good. All right. Is there a, is there a number you can dial in on? I really can't hear you. He's, he's muted. You can see his mic is muted. He's got to unmute himself. Oh, can you unmute him, Lola? Yeah, speak now, sir. Mr. Barback, can you hear and can you can you speak up so that we can s test your hear? Um, oh, well, if we can't hear you, we can't continue with your hearing. He's um, I think he's muted. No, he's not muted. I can he's see. Just, he just unmuted. Yeah. It's unmuted. Uh, no, well, you may have to call in. See the gentleman doing the presentation. He's the petitioner, correct? Mr. Barback is. Is there anybody else uh, on his team that's on this? No. Okay. <laughs> He's gonna call it. All, All right. right. Thanks, Lola. No problem. Let's see, muted. What's the number? Oh, I, I don't know. Do we have a number? Is there a number on this WebEx thing that you can call? I it? got a number on his application. I will I will give you the number again. Give me one second. 516-466-2674. If not, Lola, he can call into your office and you put him on speaker and unmute yourself. Oh, God, that's going to be disgusting. You think so? All right. No, no, no. If, if, if this fails, if this fails. All right. Give me one second. Done. It's a strike against him now, you know. <laughs> okay. He can hear us. <laughs> he can hear us. Let him die. <laughs> Based on his presentation. <laughs> there was no presentation. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> Now you wrote in the stuff fire code in New York State. You just all the other stuff that was in draft for fire code. It evolves. So yeah. yeah. What, what happened? What did I do now? You copied and pasted in the wrong stuff. Oh, I did. But... Right. I think I got it. Fire code of New York State. Right. Yeah. That's what it is. That's okay. the fire code. Did I do it right? I think I edited the right stuff. What is Erica eating? She's not sharing us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make her do this. Yeah. It, it's all. It's all. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think I got it. Yeah, it's just 2020. It's, it's versus 2050. You ha you guys tend to forget I was in Disney for four days with two kids and ate our way through Disney. I'm oh, trying to man. eat some crappy crap that will be healthy. You don't want to eat this. I want to be in her family. Her family was a trip to uh, Washington. Mm, we got to see the Mets play too. Mr. Barback, it seems that I keep getting your emails bounced back, even though I hit reply to a previous email to you. So let me read off the um, mobile device number, which is 1518 549 
0500. I give him five minutes, then we'll jump to Live Nation. Because they're here. Uh, Lola? Lola? Yes? Did you see the chat where um, Mr. Bar um, Mr. Barback asked for... Actually, he's calling me now, I see. Even though... He wanted the meeting number and he wanted something else. Sometimes you need to put in a passcode to get the meeting yeah. number to get yeah. that information yeah. in. Oh, we had video. I don't know. We don't have audio. It, it's on his. Uh, if, 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 if. Mr. Barback, yes. Do you have, do you need the access number? I can give it to you if you're. We'll try it one more time with the access code if you uh, need it or the meeting uh, password. Either or both. Uh, the access code is 161 757 4288. The meeting password is Y G S X as in mm, uh, Xerox X uh, K F U I 323. Again, Y G S X. K F U I three two three. All right. He probably needs the, the phone number also. The um the one five one eight five four nine zero five zero zero number. Right. Thank you, Barry. I did give that to him. Um let me also put it in the chat. Right, now we got two minutes. Should have taken. The chairman has suggested that um, you want to go go. If we can't connect this way, then um, we'll do <coughs> the other hearing and then uh, <coughs> difficulties. We could probably log off and log back in and see if that um, will pick up his audio. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sometimes works. I occasionally have that same problem. Sleeping. Did you hear that, Mr. Barback? Perhaps you can log off and log back on. Okay. Maybe I can take that. Okay. Hang on, go. Hurry up. Wait. I gotta get to work. No. <laughs> you get past what, 55? <laughs> yeah. I saw Chris Stapleton last summer. What a show. Yeah. I don't get out much, so I guess everything's good to me, but that mm -hmm. show is. Yeah, L. King rocked it too. She was really good. Oh, she's amazing. Oh, well, 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 where did she come from? I mean, she has, she's a handful of songs with her. Good morning. Okay. I can hear somebody. Yep. 
Success. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Lola. Where's Andy's in the bathroom? Now we lost him. Well, I can read it in. You can read it in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Second, are we ready? Yeah. Yes, Second hearing is in the matter of petition number 2023-0032. The petitioner is Robert Barback and the grief party is Dwight Lane Development, LLC. Are we going to record, Lola? Yes, we are recording. Okay. This petition pertains to a new single family dwelling of type 5B construct, wood frame construction, two stories high, approximately 4,200 square feet total gross floor area. The building is to be located at 8 Dwight Lane, Incorporated Village of Great Neck, Nassau County, State of New York. The petitioner has requested relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 511.2.6, which requires like, driveways and portions thereof that serve more than four buildings shall meet the design requirements for fire apparatus access roads as specified in Section 503. The petitioner wishes to have a driveway, driveway that serves eight dwellings in lieu of the required fire apparatus access road that is 20 feet wide. Okay. All right, Robert. Well, that pretty well sums up what we're asking for. It's actually called an emergency access driveway in the code. Uh, and as per uh, exhibit five of our application, uh, we're uh, presenting that Dwight Lane is a private roadway uh, it is under our ownership. Um, it has existed for approximately 100 years. It connects to uh, county roads, Steamboat Road and West Shore Road, and it currently provides access to seven single family residences. Um, there are portions of Dwight Lane that are physically constrained by topography, meaning there's, there's hills on either side, or there are power lines and power poles. Um, the village of Great Neck originally had asked that we get a letter from the local fire department stating that they could service, which we did. And then the village decided to then issue a denial and require a New York State variance, which we understand. Unfortunately, it's added months to this process. Um, you will also see as exhibit four, the alert engine hook and ladder um, has uh, written their letter with a couple of conditions, and those conditions are easily achieved. Um, and our drawing indicates uh, the widening of the road in two areas uh, for pass-bys, as they call turnouts, uh, and that we will achieve the average of 14 foot in width uh, with the fire department's positive statement that they can provide service. So I'm going to read that letter are... to the record, if you don't mind me interrupting you. Please, do that, yeah. Please. Well, question, that was Exhibit 4. Yeah, I'm going to read that to the record. Can you give me a minute? Uh, please. Yeah, thank you. October 18, 2022, Mr. Robert Barback, RA, Barback Associates, 19 West, 199 West Shore Road, Great Neck, New York. Dear Mr. Barback, as you requested, the Great Neck Alert Fire Company has reviewed site access for the proposed subdivision at 199 West Shore Road, Dwight Lane, Great Neck, New York. It is our opinion that the fire department can adequately protect the proposed new residents as long as the following items are included in the project. Number one, the existing paved roadway, now what was it known as Dwight Lane, is increased in width to an average of 14 feet wide. Number two, two extended road width turnout areas are installed in the repaved roadway to allow for fire apparatus passing. Number three, the existing fire hydrants on Steamboat Road and West Shore Road are maintained at their present locations. Thank you for including the fire department in the planning of the improvements on Dwight Lane. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or concerns. John Parcell, Great Neck Alert Fire Company, Chief of the Department. Okay. Good. All right, um, I guess I also did not introduce myself. Um, my name is Robert Barback, I'm a registered architect. I also happen to be the superintendent of buildings for the following villages, Port Washington North, Baxter Estates, and Russell Gardens. So Courtney and I have a long pen pal relationship as we've dealt with other things in other villages. But to this matter at hand, the three conditions uh, that were in the letter from the fire department are all indicated on the drawing um, and can easily be achieved. We're not touching the fire hydrants um, and the turnouts are easily accommodated. 
So simply put, we're asking for either relief from the requirement or a variance that would increase the number of houses that can be served by this emergency access driveway. You got any questions? Uh, first question, what do you mean by, when you say an average of 14 feet, uh, that could mean 20 feet in one area and five feet in another area. Um, this was the condition that uh, upon, uh, we met with the fire department on site. Um, there, they like to have a 15, a 14 foot minimum width. There are a couple of areas that are challenged, uh, and they said as long as we can achieve the average, then they are comfortable that they can service uh, all of the houses on this roadway. Would there be a problem with a minimum 14? Uh, there are two pinch points, and um, those two pinch points, uh, we would probably have to relocate a power line and poles to achieve. Okay. So that's why I read the letter. The letter says average in yeah. the fire department. I, yeah. You know, do you know the dimensions at those pinch points, Mr. Barbeck? Um, 12, 12 and a half at one and 13 at the other. Okay, thank you for that. And again, those those areas were specifically looked at both in terms of width and aerial. And uh, again, this was an on-site review uh, with the fire department to make sure that they were comfortable. Great. Is Great. parking, it, this is Erica, is parking currently allowed on the driveway, roadway, whatever it is? Um, I guess my answer is there is, at this time, there is no restriction against parking. Um, there, it's a very private area. Uh, there, there are no cars that park on the street, and every house that's along the street has adequate parking um, for those houses. So I would say that there, wa there was a wedding this summer where there were some cars on the street, but that's the exception to the rule. But that's when, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately, that's when accidents happen is during those events. I'm trying to be honest with you, and, and I'm saying that, yes, there was, a, there was a concern, and yet we were able to, to get cars through. Um, we have similar problems like that in other areas of, of Great Neck, so I am sensitive to the issue that you're raising. Uh, would you be a manifold new condition on that? No parking on Dwight Lane? Um, I guess what I would say is side? either no parking or no parking in those areas where the pinch points are, are critical, either one of those. Uh, the the uh, turnabouts or turnarounds, uh, what, what, what do you call those? Uh, turnouts. They're called turnouts in the code. Uh, a turnout so is, is a minimum of 22 feet by, I can't remember the length, call it 40 feet, where if you have one piece of apparatus, the another piece of apparatus can get by it. Uh, in creating those, they seem to be encroaching on private property. Uh, is, is that, how is that going to uh, occur? Um, hang on a second. I, I want to get the drawing in front of me. The first one is uh, okay. seven. So there is, there is an, un okay, uh, there is an unusual condition in the configuration of this road. Please don't ask me the history. It had to deal with some other horse path where there is actually a bulbous area that leads to this, to the proposed house. And you can see the curvilinear line where it traces around. So that the turnout first, area number one, Robert. Yes, is okay. it called? Is it late? Yes, yes. Number area number one is within the right of way. Lot forty-seven ends on that curvilinear line, so that entire area is part of the Dwight Lane. Okay. So would the, the would the um, driveway go through that area? Because I don't see any area on that lot to put a driveway in. No, lot 47 is, is a different parcel. That's not the subject property. 
Yes, okay. lot, the drive, well, that's an undeveloped lot right now, so I can't tell you what it is, but there yeah. could be a driveway that would go through that. But that's also of a size that if a driveway went through, it's really, I mean, it's oversized. Um, but that is clearly within this. And, and if Lot 47 is ever developed, they would have to come back before you just as I'm coming before you um, okay. under the same regulations. Yeah, it was um, okay, Lot 162B. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember where the property line is. Sorry. All right, the next unusual feature of this is Lot 162B, the street, the roadway actually goes through the property. Each one of these parcels, 162A ends, that's actually Kings Point. 162B is my home. 161, the road goes through that property. So, first of all, I have no objection, and I'm happy to sign any, you know, Restrictions that would say I have no objection to the to the widening of the road in that area. Um, this is each property has granted easements for this roadway to go through. It's a it's a private roadway. There's no easement for 162B. 162B has an easement, and as I say, I'm the owner of 162B and 162A. And we have no objection to this widening of the roadway as is proposed. Okay. You don't have a survey submitted with your application, right? Um, so there's nothing to you, really don't I don't, to okay. you, I don't believe so. Yeah, I don't believe there was a survey in your application. Okay. But it's a legally, it's a defined easement for this, for this road? It's not, or it's yes. going... Well, it's not a legally defined easement. It's a right. It's a right of way that that we have to grant access for, for the roadway to go to pass through that property. So, who may, whose responsibility is it to maintain all that? Mine. It's, so, it's because it's on your personal property. It's your responsibility, not some road association or some easement that there is. Correct. Oh. Sorry, I'm, I interrupted. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. That's okay. You know where I'm going with this. All right. Yep. The answer is. You are correct. There is no road association, homeowners association. I own 162B and I'm responsible for its maintenance. The people that on the subject property of 161, they will be responsible for maintaining their portion of the road. And uh, we currently own the rest of the part, the rest of the roadway, and we are responsible for maintaining it. What fire department um, uh, responds to 162A? Since that's a different village. Okay, different village, same coverage. Okay. It's, uh, again, like I said, I live in the house 162A and 162B. Very unusual situation where the, the joke is I sleep in Kings Point and my wife sleeps in Great Neck. <laughs> the, the prop, it cuts right through the middle of our house. It's a good marriage. Ah. <laughs> uh, I pay taxes to Kings Point. She pay taxes. I'm silly. I'm obviously just kidding on all of this. Most, most people give us crap that says, well, you paid to two villages. And I go, this is the way we bought the house. We love the house. Uh, it's a 100-year-old Tudor house. So, you know, we're very happy here. Are there any hydrants on Dwight Lane? Sorry. No, the hydrants are, no, the hydrants are on both ends. Uh, you can actually see the hydrant on Steamboat Road. I believe yes. it's on the drawing. Mm -hmm. And in a similar location on the opposite end um, is the other hydrant on West Shore Road. What's that? What's that lay-in? How long? She's I'm sorry. What is the? Stretches. How long is that stretch for that hydr for the two? What's the longest? Because I, I don't. I can't see on the map. It's got a bumper truck. Um, yeah, we show that if you're asking, we're asking, we're calling out the emergency access driveway length of 596 feet. And the fire department didn't want another hydrant added in there? No. No, they're fine with this. And there was a discussion with that, and you guys kind of vetted it out and decided it wasn't necessary? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, we put a lot of weight in the local being able to service and fight fires and emergencies. So, 
Um, but our fire official has a problem with it. <laughs> I don't. I, I mean, to be honest with you, that typical engine will only carry 500 feet of five inch. So to be able to get on that just seems it, it seems surprising that they wouldn't request another hydrant being located on that roadway. Uh, that's your yeah. conclusion. Uh, again, this situation has existed for almost 100 years, and there are already uh, all of these houses that that are here. There is they they. We, we looked at the two hydrants that exist. They have, remember, their letter actually specifically says as long as we don't change, you know, as long as we maintain those two hydrants. So clearly it was vetted with them. Understandable, but with a, with a roadway that has a little bit more, more room, you're able to use, you know, you can pump from a pumper to another pumper and be able to get access with, an area ladder to be able to get access in there, right? So that's the reason why, you know, one of the reasons why we're here meeting is because you're once you have one pumper in and lay in, you're not going to be able to gain access to another engine to be able to provide service to another um, house. So that's why I was asking. I'm sorry, you're asking if there were two houses on fire at the same time? No, just to be able to do get to service to the to a house that's further than 500 feet away from a hydrant. If the length okay. is 560 feet, usually you would pump from one engine to another engine and provide access into there. That's why you want a road that's wider so I can get in with a second engine to be able to get further in and not run over a hose line that's going to be blocking the um, access to the road. That's why we wanted a wider road is so you can do you can maneuver into that area. Okay. So uh, follow, again, from, from sorry. No, go ahead, Robert. You can see from the survey there are many areas of the roadway that are wider, but because of the couple because of those two pinch points, this is this was the conclusion that they reached that as long as we maintain the 14 foot average, we probably have 14 foot average as exists without us having to do anything else. But we have no problem widening the road in those couple of areas as we've shown. What's the road edge? Is it defined or is it just asphalt to dirt? Is it like Belgian block or is there a curve? Uh, it's just it's just asphalt to dirt. Okay. So. Technically, so, you can actually drive on the dirt as well. Yeah. Um, there, there, you know, there really aren't many obstructions except for those two pinch points. So just as a follow-up, because we're going to be talking about this in delib deliberation, was it ever vetted out on a cost to extend a hydrant line? Was it a cost assigned to it? Was it explored at all? Or it was just a follow-up yeah. said, okay, with your present situation? Uh, again, the, the letter specifically says as long as the two stay, so we yeah. never explored anything past that. Okay. Okay. Which side of the power lines on? Both. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's challenging. I'm going to say the majority of the power lines are on the, hang on a second, on the, I just want to make sure I'm giving it right to the, the, way this, to the south side or the southeast side. Are you a volunteer fireman too? That'll help. No. no? <laughs> Sorry. We had a previous I, architect in another hearing. He was a fireman as well. Um, sounds like no, sounds like Norm Nemec. Is that Norm Nemec? I don't I don't remember, but that that would be pretty All good right. response time. Flower Lane. There you go. Fla Flower Lane. That's behind Dwight Lane. Yes. That crosses over through Dwight Lane to 155. No. Uh, Flower Lane runs parallel and is not connected. Oh, it's hard to tell because it's all highlighted on here, so that's not that doesn't connect. Um, okay. I tried to highlight. Well, it's that's the confusing part of telling people how to get to us as they drive up West Shore Road. Don't turn into Flower Lane. Go past to the little driveway that is Dwight Lane. And um, hard to tell. That, that, that cul-de-sac looks like it. It does. Yeah. 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 Is the edge of Dwight Lane? Oh, does Dwight Lane, how far away is Dwight Lane to the cul de sac on Flower? Hmm. 
10 feet, 12 feet. It, the, at, the bulbous, at the most bulbous part of Flower Lane, um, it's maybe 10 feet. And who owns that piece of property on, on that area? Like, owns that section? Is that at the village? Or? I, I can't answer. I, I do not know. Um, the, was, it, was it ever um, explored to open that up to be able to get to Dwight Lane to add uh, uh, more access? No, that was not explored either. Uh, lot number 156 actually owns that portion of Dwight Lane that connects to West Shore Road, meaning it's their driveway. I mean, we call this a roadway. It's a private road. It really is just a big driveway. And, um, you know, that that's how they get in and out to their house, and it connects to our roadway that connects through the Steamboat Road. I'm so confused. Oh, I think I understand what you're saying. So Flower Lane and Dwight Lane run parallel to each other. Correct. And, and as a cul-de-sac, and one could think as a fire official that it would be a crash gate or something that would allow fire apparatus to yeah, turn, around turn around and get in there. And get them in, but what is it, 10, 12 feet separation? It looks like it's that 155 driveway based on the uh, area. Yeah, exactly. Well, it... Unfortunately, I, again, if you blow it up on Google Maps or something, I highlight it because you, it's hard to see where the road or driveway is. But yeah. there is the section of the of the driveway um, that ends in the private roadway, and um, it's separated from Flower Lane. I, if I was a if I was a resident on Flower Lane, I would probably object to somebody breaking through my cul-de-sac and connecting to another roadway. It's peculiar. Why wouldn't I guess you'd be crossing over the driveway to get to Flower Lane if it's only 10, 12 feet? Yeah, it, the whole thing is peculiar, but this is, the, is, you know, when things develop over time, it's like, why is my house in two villages? Yeah, so, um, but there was no and, and, there was no exploration, Robert, with the with the fire department on it, because that seems like an obvious, I mean, Erica picked it up. You know, it's like an obvious opportunity there to get to cut this distance in half. Is there any well, hydrants on Flower Lane in the bulbous part, in the cul-de-sac? Okay. Say that again about Flower Lane? I know Lane. I'm spitfiring. I apologize. I'm just talking out loud. Is there any hydrants on the cul-de-sac part of Flower Lane? I do not recall. Okay. Um, Probably let, not. If I, I, again, I, I understand your exploration, but let's go back a step because this was done on site with the fire department. It was a pretty. It's a straightforward situation where they are comfortable that they can provide the adequate service to these seven houses. We didn't need to explore other options because they were comfortable with what exists. They have worse situations. That doesn't excuse it. I'm just saying there are many worse situations. They said, hey, as long as the fire hydrants are staying where they are, we get an average of 14 feet, whatever the third condition was. You know, we're we're really not worried about this. So and, and, and hold on, I gotta say something. Yeah. I get that totally, Robert, and we really like I said before, we put a lot of weight in this letter from the fire department, but you're coming to our board for relief. So we can ask yeah. any questions we want to feel comfortable to make a decision in your favor. So it's also I why I explained that I sit yes. on your side of the table and I'm just explaining why we did not explore other options. Um I'm happy to entertain every option you're discussing. I'm simply stating for the record that the, that they did not look for other solutions because they were comfortable with this situation as as it existed. Okay. And the other side of it is is that where Great Neck um, Fire Department is um, is responsible for this, there will be additional fire apparatus. Like you don't just call if there's an actual fire there, you just don't call one fire department. You call the neighboring fire departments to come in and help out. And as our position here is to think about what the neighboring fire departments would do and how they would approach uh, would, would approach a fire, you know, in an area that they're not familiar with. And so we need to, you know, uh, under, you know, that's a view that why we're taking and looking at it in this manner. Okay. Completely understood. Unfortunately, I've been to a number of emergency call outs 
as a superintendent, not necessarily always a fire. It could be a fallen tree on the roof. And you're right. There's an awful lot of equipment coming in from all over as everybody covers for one another. Um, it is the beauty of the fact that, that this private roadway connects to, is not just one road, that one county road. It connects to West Shore Road as well. So um, with, with, with water available on both ends and or equipment access on both ends, uh, this quote-unquote through street is better than just being connected on one side only. More questions? Is Andy? Is Andy? Oh, okay. Mr. Ellis, are how, you with us? Yeah. Yep. You follow how, all this? How old, are, yeah, how old are the other dwellings that are on the street? Okay. Um, starting, I'm going to do this from the aerial. Uh, and I'm going to be approximate because who the heck knows okay. sometimes. Um, 56 is probably 50 to 60 years old. 55 is also 50 to, uh, 50 to 60 years old. 49 was built, I'm going to say, a dozen years ago. 47 is undeveloped. Uh, 161 is subject property. 162 A and B. My house is 100 years old. Uh, 156 is probably about 15 years old. Um, and the corner property, which I can't make out the number, uh, is also probably in the 20, nah, it's probably 30 years old. The only other one is across the street is 62. It's kind of a T-shaped structure. Um, that parts of that probably date back almost a hundred years and it's had a couple of additions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Anybody else? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, Robert, we're going to go deliberate. We'll be back with a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> with, excuse me, with request to petition number 2023-0032, Dwight Lane Development, LLC. Petitioner has requested relief from 19 NYCRR by 1225-2025 Code of New York State, Section 511.2.6. The board makes the following findings. Number one, the petitioner proposes to construct a new dwelling that is approximately 350 feet away from an existing public fire apparatus access road known as FAAR, FAR, located to the north, uh, known as Steamboat Road. Number two. A paved private driveway known as Dwight Lane will allow fire apparatus to come within 100 feet of the proposed dwelling. Number three, Dwight Lane will conform in all respects to Section 511.2 of the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, except that the driveway will serve eight dwellings instead of four. Number four, Dwight Lane connects to another far located to the south, known as West Shore Road. This will allow fire trucks to drive forward without the need to turn around. Number five. The applicant plans to make the width of Dwight Lane between Steamboat Road and the gate of the subject dwelling an average of 14 feet wide and install two turnouts to facilitate passing of firefighting trucks to the north and south of the proposed dwellings. There are two pinch points created by utility poles on Dwight Lane that narrow the width to a minimum of approximately 12 feet. Six, the local fire department has reviewed the applicant's proposal and found it to be adequate for their purposes. Number seven, the local code official has also indicated support for approval of the proposal. So with respect to 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 511.2.6, the board finds strict compliance with the provisions to uniform fire prevention and building code would entail practical difficulties or necessary hardship and would be physically or legally impractical. And the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the uniform code's provisions for health, safety, and security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance, excuse me, um, wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance from the provisions of 19 NYCRR, Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 511.2.6, be and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. One, that Dwight Lane shall not be a dead end road 
and shall conform in all respects to the provisions of section R511.2 of the 2025 Code of New York State, except for the number of dwellings served. Number two, that the proposed improvements to Dwight Lane as indicated in the applicant's proposal and as reviewed by the local fire department shall be implemented. However, the width of Dwight Lane shall be made a minimum of 14 feet, except at the two pinch points created by the existing utility poles. Number three, that there shall be no parking at any time on Dwight Lane and signs installed indicating as such. Number four, that the proposed dwelling shall be protected by a fire alarm system that is connected and monitored by remote central station monitoring. Number five, that this requirement for the centrally monitored fire alarm system shall be noted on the certificate of occupancy issued by the village with a further note that the system be maintained by all current and future owners of the dwelling. And number six, that in all other respects, the provisions of the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code shall be complied with. I need a motion to approve with these conditions. Andrew, so moved. May I get a second? Eric, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 This motion is approved. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plan or specification presented in support of this application. So, Robert, you got those six conditions of approval? Yep. Any questions? Nope. Okay, good job. Thank you. Uh, how long before a written uh, copy is available? Never. <laughs> uh, I think we're averaging uh, like Sorry, four, that's not it. <laughs> we're averaging like four to six weeks for a turnaround. Uh, my sign -offs. Okay. So as far as getting anything from uh, a stenographer or something, I can't answer that question. I, was no, I need to resubmit to building department with this determination. So that's it's about schedule. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think. I thank you all for your consideration. Sense. Okay, Robert. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. Um, Mr. Chair, I think that Barry may need some help identifying the next. Uh, case in terms of who is in the room with you and um, helping to identify each person who may be talking at any particular time. Um, well, we have four gentlemen here. I, they can... Can we turn the camera around? Yeah, we can turn it and you can just say, you know, your name and that address. Andy, Andy can see uh, we, we can yeah. share the, because we've got the names all the presentation. So... You are going to have, you know, I'm scared. I have two, I have two um, computers here, but I'm scared to go into the second because the last time I did it, it just made up. Thank you. Hey, Brian, Thanks. Brian Shay, can you bring up the presentation and share? Okay. If you, if you just mention your name, before you speak, that's fine. You, know, you don't have to answer anything. Super, thank you. Thanks. All right, I'm going to send a card. Okay. No, it's okay. You can throw. I'm a, I'm a lacrosse player. I can catch. He does own a splay. I'm pretty sure. Where? Yeah, but Andy should be Yeah, I played at Loyola. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. Not How's she doing? She doesn't need to see us. The front rows are just struggling. Yeah, tell her. Because it's a public meeting. She's got it. Uh, yeah, no. What, what position she put? So, one of the four defenders. If, if, if everybody from left to right introduce themselves for the four quarters, um, then when, whenever you speak, just say who you are so that the court reporter will have. Shall we turn that around? Who's left? Or do we care? No. Okay. He doesn't care. <laughs> so, um, let's start. Michael Shalom with HBC Architects, the architect for the project. Taylor Roberts, Live Nation. Scott Sapella, State Parks. Tua Twelman, New York State Parks. Okay. I'm trying to get the case on my computer and it's not coming up. But 30 seconds, we're going to let them roll. All right. On the record, 
This is the third and final hearing. It's in the matter of petition number 2023-0097. The petitioner is Ted Roberts and the agreed party is Live Nation. This petition pertains to a new building of type 2B construction, which will be occupied for recreational assembly, group A. The building is approximately 30 feet high, having one story with an occupied roof above. It's approximately 9,930 square feet in total gross area and is located at 1000 Ocean Parkway, Jones Beach, Town of Hempstead, County of Nassau, State of New York. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 1612.2, titled Design and Construction, which states, the design and construction of buildings and structures located in flood hazard areas, including coastal high hazard areas and coastal A zones, shall be in accordance with Chapter 5 of ASCE 7 and ASCE 24. The petitioner wishes to design and construct a building in accordance with the allowances for an ASCE 24 class one building. Okay, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And it's such a quick turnaround, but when we submitted it to be able to present in front of you, um, we were, have a person on the line who is going to try to share this uh, uh, little presentation that we've got. And we've already made our introductions, but I do want to kind of set the table as far as why Parks is here. Parks is our landlord. They own the facility. Uh, we as Live Nation, we are the lease or we, we have a 20 some odd year lease um, out there. And then of course, Mike is our architect. I'd like to just talk a brief history about Jones Beach. As you know, we first started, everybody, it's very iconic, right, to Long Island. It's a, it's a very iconic venue in, in all of our venues that is whole. I mean, Jones Beach is unique. It's one of the only venues where you can sit and watch a band playing in, in Zach's Bay, you know, in this relationship with the water. Uh, it's a very historic, it's listed on the historic register, and it's been modified over the years. Um, what we want to go through in this uh, outline, there we go, is we're going to talk a little bit about the history. We're going to talk how we operate it, because we think both of these are relative to the variance request. So we want to at least give, you know, some context to what we're, what we're asking. So yeah, if you go to the next slide. So, you know, historic facility. Uh, you were talking, I mean, back in the day, Guy Lombardo, it, they would do, it was a, a lot of music, it was all theatrical. And then, you know, that kind of morphed over the years uh, to what it's become today. Uh, next. And one of the big things is Hurricane Sandy. I think we all remember Hurricane Sandy the amazing thing is there was no subsequent real damage to to the historic pieces of the building. I mean, we lost the boardwalk. It, we obviously had flooded uh, because of the hurricane in the, in the seating area there. Uh, but we, with parks, put in a lot of uh, money to repair that. Well, and brought it up to the FEMA standards at that time uh, in the hurricane. Next slide. So this is, uh, to me, is the money shot relative to Jones Beach and understanding that it's a campus. It's not just one structure, it's multiple structures. As you can see, you know, we've got the, the historic stage piece and part of that uh, stadium is historic. We've got buildings A, B, and C, which are bathrooms, concession buildings. We've got the box office. The thing that brings these things all together is that they're all relatively at the same elevation. Lots of people come in and walk. And they have this, uh, uh, I guess, that's the experience that a lot of people like about James Speech is the, the proximity and closeness to the water. The other thing is that, you know, obviously with the ADA concerns, uh, we've got to both work with the historic nature, but also keep the ADA compliance through there, which 
we've been able to do this historic structure. Next slide. So how we operate, and I think this is key too to our this is a seasonal structure. We basically do it from late spring to early fall. We average 40 to you know, 25, so it just goes up and down from year to year. Uh, the facility's clean and all personnel leave at the end of the show. There, there's no, it's not a residence, nobody stays there, nobody stays there at night. The facility's open, it's not considered an area of refuge, nor would it ever be considered an area of refuge. And then again, you know, I think another thing that as far as Live Nation is concerned, it's, you know, it's that closeness and proximity with the water. And that's got, you know, a, a yin and a yang, right? It's, it's good points and it's bad points. Next slide. So, as part of our lease renewal with parks, we've made a commitment and there's a requirement that we do a lot of repairs to the historic structure. Uh, we're making a pretty large substantial investment, uh, which state parks or the state of New York is gonna reap the rewards of it. And in that, we've broken it down in multiple areas. We're refreshing a lot of the old uh, pieces of it, just from a, both a maintenance standpoint and a facade standpoint. We're expanding the existing box office. We're, we're doing an addition to the stadium uh, that has been approved by SHPO to where we're keeping the historic look, but trying to add more infrastructure. And then, of course, the variance project that's in front of you is a piece of that is as well. Uh, and so with that, we can, next slide, get into the specifics of the bit. So just some backline um, current conditions, the site is located in, I believe, zone AE, which is designated as eight feet. I'm sorry, Mike Shellholm, the HBC Architects, for the Architect for the Project. Um, the current conditions of the site and where it's located again is, is per the firm, FEMA maps, it's it's zone AE, which is designated as HE, which would be the base flood elevation. Next slide. Um, the existing historic theater was constructed with a seawall that is stated, set at approximately 4.15 feet. And that exists today in that old red line, as you can see on the screen. Next slide. And as Ted mentioned earlier, the, 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 the proposed work being done and some of the design challenges really occur on what we call the West Plaza, of the existing theater, where there are a number of new open air structures being built to improve the the overall experience, including what we're here today to speak to you all about, which is what we're calling the Members Club, which is a, an elevated experience for some of the VIP guests. Um, the challenges of this Members Club and this experience for the guests was obviously fitting in with the historic nature of this historic venue while still trying to maintain and meet all ADA codes as well as egress codes. Um, which was one of the challenges in so trying to set the finished floor elevation to where it meets with what is existing. Next slide. So you can see this is kind of posed rendering of the VIP plaza looking back towards the theater and the structure on the left in this slide is the proposed members club. It is a two story structure with uh, an enclosed space on the first floor, an open roof deck on the second floor, which has fantastic vistas of both the theater and the Vax Bay. Um, next slide. And as mentioned earlier, some of the code constraints and um, requirements that we had to comply to 
are predicated by New York State Building Code Chapter 16 with reference to then the design manuals of ASCE 7 and 24. Um, the state, uh, or the site, I'm sorry, is currently designated, as I said earlier, Zone AE, which would require a Class 3 flood classification which would require the building to be raised to, I believe it's eight feet plus a one foot freeboard, which brings it up to nine feet. It would be approximately five feet higher than what we are currently proposing for that structure. Um, and again, it ties back to the historic nature of the property and trying to keep the two proposed and existing to interrelate and work with each other for both ADA and egress purposes, which is why we're requesting the variant stuff not complying with the nine feet and instead treating the building as a wet flood proof and meeting the requirements as such. As stated by Shippos, the theater is a contributing complex within the historic district. Many changes in elevation would be counterintuitive of this historic setting. The next few slides are just some code of things that we had put in. As Ted stated earlier, the structure that we're here for them, the and all the structures are seasonal use only. They would not be used in any predetermined storm, storm events. Um, and therefore, any human intervention measures are stated in chapter six of the design manual. And it is also a historic structure. So we are respectfully requesting that we can comply with flood, class one flooding for wet flood proofing meet those criteria. Good boy, a lot to talk about. That conclude the presentation or so you guys wanna highlight anything else or well I did want to I, you know, we we did look extensively at ASCE table for flood designs and classifications of structures. Okay. And although not specifically stated, um, flood classifications of type one are for structures that pose minimal risk to the public and are unoccupied. And we do feel that, although not specifically stated, this venue and this building would never be occupied during a, a, a plant, or during a scheduled storm event. It would always be unoccupied and therefore it does pose a minimal risk to the public. So, Mike, you're looking at table 1 1? Yeah. Okay. I, I uh, fully agree with the fact that it will be unoccupied during storm events. I'm also uh, familiar with uh, and have heard before years ago the procedures that state goes through when storm events occur over there. Uh, since I was on the board and heard the uh, petition for the Trump on the ocean. The, the infamous Trump on the ocean. I'm that old, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, however, in terms of what's required by that class one, uh, the, the types of structures that it indicates in there uh, doesn't seem to uh, comply with that at all. Uh, in my mind, this is a class two. Uh, the other thing, and it's very hard to see, but on the FEMA map, it seems to me uh, that you're in a, a FEMA A9, not an A8. I think the, the, the A9 is more of the stage or outside of the, the shoreline, if you can show. Oh, okay. okay. And then the AE8 is everything where we're working, which is from the shoreline back, very close. Yeah, let me see the map. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, it's, we went back to the bottom. Because the historic theater piece sits in the bottom, and the, the shore based stuff sits in. West like Plaza. Area. Area. Oh, Everything land based is on A. When they filled in the orchestra level, um, which would used to be the boat in the water, everything outside of that or in the water from that is denied. 
since we're on elevation, um, Courtney, isn't that a two-foot freeboard? Am I incorrect with that? Yes. I think what the designers did was they went straight to ASCE 24 without first going to our requirement building code, which adds an additional two feet above what uh, ASCE 24 demands. Uh, so the base flood elevation is the is the A, the AE8, and the design flood elevation should be 10. Absolutely. And then if you go into to, 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 um, ASCE 24, there are additional uh, free board requirements over and above the state the mm -hmm. state's Interesting. requirements for certain classes of buildings. Okay. So that one, is that one foot then above the BFD or the DFE? The DFE. The DFE. That's above the DFE. The DFE 24 demands okay. that you place the building not at eight feet, but 10. Not at 10 feet, but, but at 10 plus one foot for a class two structure. Class two structure. So five, five and a half feet below that. So I was then, just going to ask that question. Uh, so your proposed finished floor is 5.5? 5. 5. Yeah, so the plaza in yeah. front of it is set up based on the existing grades. The, what we've managed to do with the members club is to get that elevated up another foot and a half. So we're at 5.5. You're doing three, three rises up. Right. Okay. What, uh, do you know what elevation uh, the water reached uh, during Sandy? See those photos? Yeah, it, yeah, but well, do we have the elevation of the orchestra? Yeah, it, it, it got into the orchestra pit uh, and flooded the, <coughs> the VIP area. The uh, existing seawall that is inside of that orchestra pit is set, I believe, at 4.15. <laughs> I think it got just about to that, which is what the orchestra pit is just, on, just below, right? So you're talking about four, probably four and a half. And, you know, again, operationally for us, having that building in the historic plaza, trying to keep the historic plaza, it's just an unattainable situation, raising a building six, eight feet right there. Uh, well, I can understand. That. Right, because if we've even looked at, you know, other options as we were looking at the code and both trying to put in let's say 88 switchbacks or whatever that really starts to then impact our heat rest ability because that's the other you know these are we we basically have an occupancy of let's call it 15,000 so if an emergency happens or something we're very cognizant of how do we egress 15,000 people relatively quick and so we've looked at this in multiple areas, and hence that's why we're here with the variance because there's really no other options for this. Right, we did look at the map scenarios that noted, and it just it adds so much width outside of that building that encroaches into the clearance of the plaza for exiting, and also then increases the ADA exit run from the members' club itself going down how many linear feet of ramp to get out. So, what's your occupancy for the building? But you're for the whole it, it's calculated it's occupancy. It's more for the facility. I mean, we're, we're, they sell fifteen thousand dollars. No, I'm talking about no, no, this no, members no, club. No. The, the members club. I think we're keeping it right around twelve. Be the max occupancy. So then, how many exits you need out of the members club? I think it's actually less than that because we have two. We have there are two stairwells and an elevator for ADA purposes. But we have two two exit stairwells. And so whole one exit one there. primary exit would need to be accessible. Yes. So you have that with your elevator? Yes. Okay. Um, and then there is a ramp, like we mentioned earlier, there is three steps up and there is a ramp. Which is tolerable yes. to an 18 inch ride rather than a 5.5 foot. Um, and it's slab on grade? It's all it structural slab on grade. Okay. It's actually oh. structural slab on file. So 
So if it was to stay at this proposed elevation in a class two, it would need to be dry proofed or wet proof? What no, class two would have to be dry proof. Dry proof. Is there a hardship to achieve dry flood proofing? It is a cost perspective. Okay. Well, it's a pretty nice building. It's pretty sexy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem with the wet proofing, uh, yes. you would have to go to the, that, that elevation, right? Yes. See, and so when you look at the rendering, uh, Ryan, can you go back to the rendering, please, of the, the, the that one? So, you know, that kind of kills it, too. Uh, again, you know, trying to make the sales for Jones Beach is it's very iconic in its relationship with water. So we've got a lot of storage up there. It would almost, you know, in reality, if we tried to make it wet through it, we would have to lose all of that stuff. Yeah, the whole front wall that you can see on the left uh, there is, is it's basically an operable manual system or a type of manual system that during an event is put to that terrace in the front. Well, that's aluminum and glass though, right? So it is. I mean, it's nice because it mimics the, the whole entrance, the actual ticket entrance. It's got that Art Deco look to it. Yes. Is it's there any way, because stone is dry, right? It's, it's not dripboard. I mean, is it something that could comply? I don't want to design for you, you guys, intelligent guys. The problem with the wet uh, flood proofing is that your interior walls are gypsum and with insulation, bad insulation, that would not comply. So you're not complying with even if it was a class one, building doesn't comply. Well, we would use flood resistant. We can bring, you know, instead of sheetrock on the inside, we can put cement board and items like that that are flood resistant materials. Possibly foam insulation and right. that. instead of that rigid, you know, things like that. Because that structurally, it's a CMU. I'm not, yeah, I'm not concerned structurally. Yeah, no, that's good. You know, I think. Without me sounding like an idiot, you're asking for a ticket to be about 1,200 people there? Like that 1,200 tickets will be sold for that area? He's got a rooftop, the rooftop amenity. He's got a lot of occupants up there, okay. a couple R and stuff. So the actual members club building, if I'm speaking out of turn, um, that can house 1,200. He, uh, Mike said it's a little less. Probably less just based on the exiting. I mean, we, we have it down to two, two stairwells. Um, but I think the overall plaza, right, the VIP plaza, plaza is more so 1,200. Oh, yeah, okay. so two exits, I think, is what, 500? Right. Yeah. yeah, so you need more. more. Well, they, they well we would have the, the, the second floor of the rooftop would be maxed out at the, the, the two egress points, the two, okay. exits, the two stairwells. So, All right. So it's the second floor plus the first floor plus the plaza is what we're selling. So, you know, the 1,200 VIP tickets for Biggest yeah. problem with exiting is the, yeah, the uh, car parking car. lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. getting out of the parking lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And then what and is the so limited to the amount of seats in the tent. One at a time. I go there for the Markham Challenge, even with only a couple of thousand people that they have. It's, it takes forever to get out of the parking lot. Well, exactly. They, they have, they it's only, only typical, uh, they have close to 10,000 people. So you're aware. Put a mark on it. Yeah. And again, for the record, this is Ted Rollins. When I said 1,200, I was talking to the VIP. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I understand. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I, I understood. Thank you. I, I think I would be amenable to granting a variance to the dry flood proofing, but not to the class. He's speaking for himself. That I'm speaking for myself. But I understand where you're going with it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I personally kind of agree that I can't see it. I mean, I understand the temporary aspect, but if you read the class one, it's not a temporary structure. Um, yeah, I even, mean, even though the use is temporary, is seasonal, not a, I think it's still not a temporary structure. Yeah, you know, like a bubble or a tent or something like that. Is it difficult to achieve that 
dry flood proofing that we're talking about? Would that be something that would be? I think it's just difficult in, the, in its current design with, with it wanting to be open and, and glass. And yes, it is a glass and aluminum storefront, but to design the glass and aluminum storefront to be able to withstand and hold back five, six, seven <sighs> people. Because dry flood proofing water still potentially can get into. I'm just spitfiring here. Uh, How many sides? We're requesting the wet flood yeah. proofing. Yeah. That's exactly for that reason. To, to to hold back that amount of water in a dry flood proof system, right? So in a dry flood proof system, you don't want the water to enter. Where are the one where we're allowing for that to happen? We're designing to a certain amount of elevation with flood resistant materials. And we know that there's, there's no threat to human because there are no human occupancy during an event. So we need to protect the structure and we're gonna do so in such a way where we're providing flood proof resistant materials inside and allowing the water to pass through. Where are the uh, utilities? So the utilities will manage to get up higher, especially in this building since there is a second level, all of the utilities, all of the electrical, all of the hot water heater, everything, will be set above that floodplain. That will be, we'll be able to achieve. Okay. What, can we be specific? Like what elevation are we talking about? The second floor, I, I can get you the exact number, but it's at least 12 to 15 feet higher than the first elevation, which is already at five and a half. Okay. So complying with the code required DFE. Yeah. Yes. So yes. The minimum, anything above that is elective? Yes. Okay. So all the utilities would be above that elevation. Uh, except for receptacles and Stuff like that. A bunch of panels and the breakers all feeding that one. He said, okay. How many sides of this uh, structure has the nano wall and the ability to open up? Just the one facing the West Plaza there? What is it? Exactly. So, is this replacing your current like VIP that has the tent? That's what okay. Is. All right. So, you're making this more permanent. So really to give the, 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 the guests a better elevated experience. Okay. And part of the overall improvements that Live Nation is making today, the historic district. Right. And again, you know, New York State Parks would be the beneficiary of the new structure. So I read the summary, one story. Is it a one or a two? It's a, it's, it's a one story with a rooftop. Two the stories. building code is classified as two stories? Building code allows a building that has third of its space enclosed to be regarded as part of the story below. Did, they, they didn't provide dimensions for us to assess that. And um, there was debate about whether the additional uh, open roofed bar area contributes to that one third but that, that's, that, that, that's not affecting this application. Oh, just for accuracy, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, it's it could be classified as a two-story? You could call it a, a one-story with a rooftop. No, I'll call it a two-story. I call it half full. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I call it a beautiful building with pretty misters of Zach Bay. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> Yeah, what I think here is from the rooftop, it seems like an odd angle to see the stage. It, you barely we see got, the We've got limited sight lines. And yeah. that, you know, that's, that's what drives our business, right, is understanding, you know, views and sight yeah. lines of this. But we also supplement that with TVs, with show feed. So uh, a lot of people, they feel the closeness to the band have a slight skewed view, but then they can still see it on a screen will potentially hang there. And another uh, factor is a lot of the people that would actually be coming to this club are either box suite holders or they've got their other suites as well. So, so they'll hang out here, but still have a seat in the theater. And as we all know, they can hear from anywhere in the theater. <laughs> or even across the room. <laughs> Depending on how the wind is blowing. <laughs> Courtney, there's the risk category in the ASC 7. Is that germane to this application? The, the no. one, two, and three? No? No. I don't think it is. So we're not, we're, we're still designing it for, for 
all of the other risk categories in terms of hurricane and wind and loads and things like that in terms of structure. structure yeah. The only thing here where we're asking for is for, uh, I guess, a reconsideration in terms of the flood part of the risk category. A ASC 7 yeah. is related yeah. to structural uh, design. Right. And that was the 24 one. is related to the flood. Gotcha. So you currently have, um, I know because I've been there. So you currently have food stuff there as well. How much flooding have you had during the year in that area? That area doesn't, that area doesn't. Yeah. So, okay. Well, truth be told, the only area that they have had water, which they are mitigating, is in the orchestra bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it, that's it, been taken, you know, they have temporary measures in place. For right. That. And, and not to go down a funny trail, but that is a separate issue that we're working in partnership with parks. Okay as to the long-term flood proofing of the campus itself, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, right now the flooding is really limited to, you know, five or six events a year when you get that perfect full moon, king tide, you know, and the wind blowing. And then that brings the water up over that lower part. But where this structure goes, I don't, I mean, there's, there's no it, it didn't seem like it, but again, I was walking, I wasn't walking on, you know, the ground to know what it felt like, right? So it was kind of hard. And we are building it up from higher than what it's current. Okay. Because we, you know, we obviously just don't want to build something to have it flood but, and destroy. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to balance that between, you know, the historic campus, our needs operationally, in, in that and that's where it's just you know building it to what the current code would require and that is just unattainable and we're hoping again that, that this looking at things like we said in context of the historic nature of all of these other buildings in the interrelationship between that with health care today right we're, we're fixed by existing elements of the historic theater itself right the concourse elevation which everybody enters through is set at an elevation the parking lot is set at an elevation so we're fixed to have the guest experience continue to have that relationship between those existing elevations and with what we're doing new so we did try we do have elements that we are raised we have the perimeter which is raised as ted alluded to along the, the, the water as edge itself then that plaza level is give or take the gray area right there where you can see it's set at about four feet. And then we come back up again into the members club another foot and a half. So we have tried to get it as high as possible while still maintaining those connected points with the historic theater. But to go beyond that just is, is starting to be a hardship. Do you guys have procedures in place if let's say a storm's coming up the coast, you guys sandbag and stuff? Or? Absolutely. I mean, you think of the liability that we carry, and of course. So if we see a threat, we close down the park. We the park and it apparently is very threat. We will close down the park system so that it doesn't go down the twenty ocean park three, what whatever, just so that everybody is safe. So we have them. Sandy and all the other storms as well. So we have no procedures in place to evacuate. We do not wait. We evacuate long before storm arrives. Mm -hmm. And protection for property and stuff like that. Do you have procedures for that? Sorry? As far as the actual yeah. structure? Well, we, I, so you said before, we sandbag every structure. Okay. We now have a bulldozer up at the Sandy where we build a wall of sand in front of the main sections of Jell Beach. This is on the base side, mm -hmm. as you know, yep. not the ocean side, but we build up so that we protect our infrastructure in the central mall at the bathhouse so that we are protected. So okay. we go into a home office, we you know take windows, we do everything that we can. We've been doing this for a lot of years and it's been a lot of before Sandy, before everything, we were doing it to protect our facilities and minimize the impact so that we didn't have to go back and go crazy trying to rebuild something. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. The, um, the good thing about their show schedule is that for the most part, it, it's wrapping up when storm season is picking up. Mm -hmm. So there's a very little overlap between the two. And like Chip had alluded to earlier, if there is a forecasted storm, the whole the whole park is shut down. Okay. So any shows that are scheduled to cancel. Yeah. Have any other questions? Well, with climate warming now, you probably extend all year long. <laughs> Somebody give them that idea. <laughs> Looking at just the wet purchase dryer. Whatever the application. Mr. Ellis, 
You still with us? Yeah. Yep. Do you have any questions or comments? I'm good right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, you know, this is for you know that the building that's currently with design won't pass wet flood proofing muster because of the interior um, partitioning being of um, flood, uh, non flood resistant materials, correct? You're aware of that. Right, but our, well, I guess what we're proposing is to have it with flood resistant materials. So it would be right now the perimeter is masonry. The interior would be metal stuck with, say, cement board and, and foam insulation as opposed to bad insulation. So it would meet those up to that elevation of flood resistant materials. And it would be, uh, you know, that you have to design to, the, to allow the, the flood doors to shutters. Yes. For that the wetness to come right. Right. That's, right. That's, so we do have back insulated flood shutters for the square footage that's required on that linear foot of wall. I do have one more question. There's never been, I mean, I don't recall, but you know, I didn't live here my whole life, um, that there's been a flash event that we've had to evacuate out of there due to water, right? Okay. Flash like a, fl a flash flood event in that area. Okay. Lightning. Yeah, and I, I've been there when it's been lightning. Yeah. But, lightning. <laughs> you know, but okay. They do have procedures in, in yeah. for those storms and lightning, things like that, but flash flood. I didn't, yeah, I didn't think it was, I'm just trying to, think out you know no, would you bring up a good point again operation because it's an open amphitheater and across all of our amphitheaters we have a system of weather watch that's very important to us relative to rain events because not only to the fans but also the band lightning events you know in other areas where tornadoes are at so we have a very detailed system because we do take that serious it's in None of our interests to have somebody hurt in one of those types of events. So, so yeah, we've got procedures with the state. We've got internal procedures dealing with any weather. It's just the emergency manager and me trying to make, <laughs> think about that. All right, okay. Exactly. It's not the appropriate emergency manager. Emergency manager planning. Okay. Say fire police, fire department, fire department. We work with that. And we've made our events down there. So we have a okay. any great system in place and a great plan. And the parks police actually have a trail right out in front of the parking lot area. Right. So they're on premise. Okay. Right. Awesome. In that West Plaza, are there any other enclosed structures that are at a similar elevation? They're all open structures? Well, yeah. so the box office, uh, Ryan, if you could go back to the aerial or if you look at the aerial of the existing. Uh, uh, there is a facility box office that we're remodeling and expanding, but it's part of the remodel to an existing structure. And then there is an addition to the historic theater that will house some uh, food service equipment and cooking to, to support that area. Right, Ryan, if you could go back to where I call out the box office and building A, B, and C. Because, yeah, so it, it's a campus, and in that campus, there you go. So you see the box office which is going to be directly across from this proposed building uh, is at the set elevation as long as buildings a b and c that what we commonly call the concourse and plaza right uh it's hardscaped and it's all hardscaped for that elevation and that was part of the challenges of you know designing right the existing this is the plaza that redeveloped this will grow, be remodeled, and there will be a kitchen extension off of the existing theater as an addition to the theater. The area we're looking at is about here. It was a VIP oh. area with like. That's that area that they're redoing. Like, uh, yeah. With the tents. Yeah. yeah. You haven't been in there? Oh, come on. No, it was last year. <laughs> <laughs> but it looked kind of temporary. It wasn't a, you know, a, and they may tweak conditions in the RP that they would have to meet with regard to the construction, with regard to stabilization of some areas, and 
they put together a larger proposal for the entire area. Peter is almost 70 years old now. So this is a great modernization so that it stays the historic structure, but also is ready for the next 70 years. So that was the intent of the RFP and the contract, which a lot of industry did. And that was. All right. I think we're going to run up more than 70 years. So we're going to lose heart. The vote will be hindered. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. We're gonna we're gonna hash this out. We'll call you right back in as soon as we can. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. What what's your hard stop? My hard okay. stop. No, All right. I might be a little fast, but you don't want to lose your vote. Yeah. No. Just God forbid we lose one vote. You guys have tanked probably. <laughs> Potential. Potential. All right. Back on the record. Okay, are we recording? All right, with respect to petition number 2023-0097, agreed party, Live Nation. Petitioners seeking relief from 19 NYCRR part 1221, the 2020 building code of New York State, section 1612.2. The board makes the following findings. Number one, building that is the subject of this petition is called the members club and will have a lounge area with tables and chairs for eating toilet rooms and a kitchen on the first floor. An elevator and two stairways will provide access to the rooftop area. The rooftop area will have a bar and tables and chairs for eating and lounging. The rooftop area will be boarded by perimeter half walls. Two, the proposed building is to be located in an AE8 flood zone and is assumed to be landward of the Limwa, which is the line of moderate wave action. This means that the anticipated BFE is eight feet NAVD 88. The lowest floor is proposed to be at elevation 5.5 NAVD 88 for the petitioner's statement. Number three, for section 1612.4 of the 2020 Building Code of New York State, the design flood elevation in New York State is two feet above the elevations in the flood insurance rate map. This means the design flood elevation is 10 NAVD 88 and ASCE 24 also requires an additional one foot above the DFE, making the required first floor elevation 11 NAVD 88. Four, the petitioner wishes the board to reclassify the proposed building and allow it to be designed in accordance with the provisions in ASCE 24 as a class one building. Class one buildings are defined according to their use in table 1.1 of ASCE 24. Number five, footnote C of table 2-1 of ASCE 24 allows a class one structure to have the top of its lowest floor below the DFE if wet flood proofing techniques are employed. The stated reason for the applicant's request to reclassify the building as class one is to allow wet flood proofing at the subject building. Number six, the building is not for temporary storage or agriculture use as required by table 1.1 of AFCE 24. The board is of the opinion that the proposed building should be reclassified as a class one building and should be properly classified as a class two. Did I read that right? No, it should not. Should not be reclassified as a class one building and it should be properly classified as a class two building. Number seven, wet. Flood proofing in accordance with ASCE 24 allows the lower portion of the building to be inundated by flood water, provided all materials in contact with the flood waters are flood resistant. Eight, the structure as presented in the petition's drawings does not incorporate all flood resistance materials below the DFE. The drawings provide details of the material wall sections that call for drywall construction. Number nine, table 2 1 of ASCE 24 allows class two non residential buildings to utilize dry flood proofing techniques below the DFE. Dry flood proofing is described at, at section 6.2 of ASCE 24 and involves the use of some pumps and possible use of flood shields to keep water out. The petitioner indicated that such dry flood proofing would be impractical and cost prohibitive. So with respect to 19 NYCRR part 1221, 2020 building code of New York State section 1612.2, the board finds strict compliance with the provisions to the uniform fire prevention and building code would entail practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship and would be physically or legally impractical. And the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the uniform code's provisions for health, safety, and security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance from the provisions of 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, Section 1612.2, be and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. Condition number one, that the building shall be located landward of the Limois, the line of moderate wave action. 
Number two, that the building shall be designed as a class two building in accordance with ASCE 24. And number three, that all construction materials below the DFE plus one foot shall incorporate wet flood proofing construction, including but not limited to the protection of plumbing and sanitary systems as specified, as specified in ASCE 24, 2016, just in time. I know. <laughs> I need a motion, to, a motion to approve with these conditions. Andrew, so, so moved. I guess, Erica, second. second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is approved. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to specific building and application before it as contained within the petition. It should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plan to specifications presented in support of this application. Free condition. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good job, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. And one more condition. <laughs> <laughs> one jazz job at least. <laughs>